Hey, hello and welcome back to Curiously Polar. My name is Chris Marquardt and this is Henry. Hi, Henry. Hi, Chris. How are you today? Very good. No, Long time, no episode. Um, Indeed. But we're not going to make any excuses other than that everyone has been busy. Busy in these times. How could that be possible? But um, It's luxurious, isn't it? It's it's that's a nice problem to have, I think. So, but apologies that we um, have let you hang for a couple of weeks. Um, we're back with uh, an episode not necessarily about doom and gloom, as we usually do here. <laughs> the Arctic news aren't that uh, pleasant all the time. No, we want to talk about photography today, about auroras, because it is aurora season. It is indeed. T and tell us a bit about the possibly, auroras in general. It's possibly the most um, amazing season of the year. Usually when we have summer trips, then people are asking, yeah, but what do you do in winter? It's like, you can't do anything. And I'm always a little bit offended by that because for me, the winter is kind of like the heart of, um, of the polar regions when everything calms down, everything just settles a bit. And... You know, we, we just use the time um, when we have so much dark season to actually really look out for, for northern lights. And um, once you've experienced your first northern light, you really get drawn into its magic. And for me, this is like the the, the best season of the year. Yeah, the, the, when you and I met, that was a couple of years ago in Lofoten, uh, in the Arctic, and it was on a ship, and it was in February, so it was right in uh, the Arctic winter, and uh, we saw some of the most amazing auroras there. So That's true. Uh, Lofoten yeah. is one of uh, my favorite uh, regions to spot um, northern lights, really mm -hmm. great. Um, beautiful backdrop on pictures always, when you yes. have this beautiful panorama of the landscape in the in the backdrop but we have a number of destinations around the arctic circle and um lofoten is one of them iceland is very popular you have mm -hmm. uh, destinations in greenland where you can travel of course arctic canada alaska and um, also russia and it's and it's uh it's one of these phenomena that um doesn't show itself all the time so every time i was in the Arctic, uh, I was glad to be there for just more than a few days because uh, sometimes you can go for an entire week without really seeing anything serious. And there are tools that you can use. There's like observatories, magnetic observatories that, that will try to predict where the Earth's magnetic field goes. And if that goes low, then the aurora has a better chance to come into, the, or the solar wind has more chance to come into uh, contact with the upper um what is it stratosphere ionosphere i think it is and but the, the thing is actually that most tourists come to those destinations with a um clear objective of they want to see northern lights and they expect the northern lights to happen just on time <laughs> and one of the most popular questions is when does that actually happen when does it start and there is no particular science behind it. It's not really that you, you have the forecast that says it starts at uh, 2115 minutes and it ends at uh, uh, half past 10. It's, yeah. it's really um, something the, the magnetosphere or the, the um, solar activity gives you a hint, but it doesn't um, relate to a precise forecast. It's yeah. even more fragile than the weather forecast, actually. So sometimes you have a very good forecast and you see nothing, and sometimes you have a very little forecast but have a beautiful explosion on the sky. The the forecast can only be um, about the how high the chances that you can see them. And there's Indeed, uh, yeah. satellites out there that can give you in information about the solar wind ahead of time. So you kind of know that there's a bit of a higher chance. But then again, there's other factors that play into that that we do not really have any uh, advanced information about. So um, the most important on the on most destinations is winter is kind of a very harsh season um, nonetheless. So it means you might have amazing auroras, but you don't see anything because it's <laughs> simply cloudy. It's cloudy, yeah. So, so the, to, to see the auroras, you have to have uh, several factors to play in your favor. Um, and I was lucky enough that that happened a few times I was up there. And so uh, what we want to do is look at some aurora photos. I want to give some insights. Me being a professional photographer, um, just on how to Are shoot you? them. What? Do, yes, I am. 
Can't yeah. you tell? <laughs> so <laughs> we we are we are. Um, I have I have tips and tricks ready for you and a few stories about some of those pictures. So what I will do is I will put ourselves the two of us into little boxes on the side. Um, so yeah, for everyone who's listening to that, just as an audio podcast, this we is also a visual a video. episode. This is a visual <laughs> episode. You better it's, it's go. It's a very visual. Yeah. You better go in the description and click that link or tap that link to watch this on YouTube because um, talking about photos is one thing. Um, and the tips will certainly work in just audio, but um, the visuals are very helpful here. So, um, and I, I can step through a bunch of pictures. I've, I think I prepared like 10 pictures, but um, <clears throat> so I want to start with a couple of things here. And uh, this is a picture from Lofoten. And uh, what you see is a uh, mountain range, which are very frequent in Lofoten. And uh, some, it's, it's a kind of a faint aurora above them. Um, and I remember distinctly how I almost froze off my feet. Not literally, but it was really cold, which it is in winter in Lofoten. And you end up with... Um, Spending some time out, so you better have a good, nice warm coat and good boots and things, uh, because you, there's a good chance you'll you'll stand next to your tripod for uh, several hours. And that's like the key when you observe northern lights. It's not much of activity. You have to be very patient. You're standing still for quite a long time, so you better pack yourself really warm, insulate. Have possibly mm -hmm. um, even a thermo with tea or coffee or hot chocolate with you. Yes. Just be prepared. And what you can see on that picture in particular is on the on the sea. You have the sea as a foreground here in front of the mountains. You have those tiny little frizzles on the uh, on the water, which is just wind picking up. So it was one of the, of the of the few <laughs> very frosty nights on that trip. I remember. Yes. So so uh, and the aurora wasn't very strong. So what what we saw here is um, the aurora coming and going, and on an on a scale of one to ten, that might have been a, a two or a three maybe. So it was very faint in the sky. So what I did here is I just took a very very long exposure this is a minute or something around that just to capture enough light so the eyes barely saw the aurora this is really what the camera saw because it could expose so long so that the camera's on a tripod a sturdy tripod um i made sure that it is dark so that like stray light shining into your lens from like a light around the houses or a street light or something can uh can really become very pronounced and 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 um, uh, a bit of a disturbance in the photo when you when you expose for that long, and uh, then yeah, to make to increase the chances of this being a bit more a bit more interesting, the photo because I couldn't really see with my eyes. I deliberately included the foreground because uh, what happens when you when you expose long and you have moving water, that water will turn into sort of a, it will have a misty kind of surface because you average out all the time that you expose. And um, so, yeah, I did a very a kind of a central composition. There's this notch in the in the mountain, which I put dead center. And then I just uh, gave it some time. Not much motion in the air. So you see a bit of motion in the clouds, but not too much because um, they weren't moving that fast. And uh, the whole, totally together, um, I'm, I'm very happy with the photo still, even though the aurora is, I'd say aurora experts would say that's ah, a boring aurora because it doesn't have hard edges. It's not very pronounced. It's more like a green, um, what would we say that? A green mist in the sky. Indeed. But what I really like in this picture, um, I remember that night and it was very, very fine for um, the experienced eye on location. But when you showed me that picture on the camera, that was this kind of the of the of the proof for for a guide. You always have your camera with you just to check if there's some activity in the sky, and then you wait for the activity to increase. And this mm -hmm. is this one of those uh, moments where you actually have proof of activity in the sky. And I remember when you showed me that that picture, and I, I think I was most uh, amazed about the reflection in the sea, which is only possible through the long. Um, long exposure because it evens out as is at the the uh, the time the the movement of the ocean and suddenly it uh, it functions as a mirror of the very faint um, 
a yeah. northern light so that's really really great and what you can see in that picture as well is it has a very faint um border of the light where the green turns into an orange yellow which is always um very very nice to see it's very difficult to see with the eye especially on a faint light like this but on the picture, you can see that very, very nice. Uh -huh. And by, by the way, one thing I wanted to point out is, especially now, we're recording this in October 2020. There's just a new bunch of uh, iPhones with even more advanced cameras coming out. Uh, the, the Android phones have been really good in terms of cameras. I think the camera is the killer app in these phones. And a lot of people won't have a big DSLR or mirrorless camera. They will have a smartphone. A current generation smartphone that has a night mode built in is capable of seeing the aurora as well and taking quite decent pictures of it maybe not I was really quite surprised yes maybe not quite as sophisticated at this as, as this one but for most people they will be very happy uh, even especially if you can put the camera on a little or the smartphone on a little tripod you know a little thing you stand on a rock or on a table or on a fence post or something um or just prop it up against a rock or something and then have it do a long exposure um, they are very very capable really really nice so that's that's one thing from land and we'll have a few more photos let me bring that I have to press the right buttons here there we go um, <clears throat> here's one um, that was taken off a ship and I think yeah this one is a better example um, that was a very oh, nice beautiful. one that was a very very nice one and um, it is interesting to uh, to be able to do this. A lot of people say, wait a minute, you ha you're standing on a moving platform. A ship is swaying. So how on earth can you do this kind of shot from that ship? Because, I mean, it isn't very straightforward um, how to do this. But it is clearly possible, as you can see. So um, there's a few things that you can do. And the one is try to keep the exposure as short as possible. It's in general true when you want to shoot something uh, and you are moving or it is moving. So um, that is the first tip. Of course, in order to be able to do that, you will need a camera with a higher sensitivity. So um, the, the technical term for that is ISO. You can crank this up and <clears throat> you trade some let's say more more noise in the picture uh, for higher sensitivity but that noise is something you can mostly take care of or relatively easily take care of if you have motion blur if you have a shaky picture that's impossible to take care of later so um and then the other thing is how <clears throat> how hard is the ship moving so this exposure i think was under two seconds it was a very high ISO, probably 6400. Um, the ship was moving, but it wasn't moving too badly. And the one thing you will notice is when you're on a ship is that the motion is normally a regular motion. Ship goes up and down and up and down, or it sways side by side by side. And there is a cycle there. And the one thing you want to do is gauge the waves. You want to Deter, de develop a feeling like when is the high point because that's when the ship is stopping just for a second and then it comes back down again and de the size of the ship kind of determines how fast that is but um, with most ships you'll have about a second one and a half seconds up on the top of that wave and then it comes back down again so if you time your photo exactly to that point like start right before it stops and then stop uh, the exposure right after that. Um, there's a good chance that you will have uh, one or two or three or five pictures that are in focus, that are sharp. That's the one thing. So if you if you gauge that right and if you if you manage to get the exposure as low as possible, again that kind of requires a camera with a bit more control. But uh, even with the smartphones, you depending on the photo app the camera app that you use you can change this, uh, the exposure time so there is uh, certainly a way to do that and um, then shoot a lot <laughs> it's probably the best advice that I can tell you um, of, of this this very night I remember distinctly we were on the ship and then we had dinner and in the middle of dinner I think it was the captain coming in shouting aurora 
And everyone <laughs> dropped their forks, <laughs> ran out, put the jackets on, grabbed the camera. So you have to be ready because, again, it's hard to predict. If I remember even correctly, impossible. even the chef did that. Or the chef were uh, some someone noticed and shouted it. I don't remember exactly who, but someone. No, no, I mean, e even even the chef. Oh no, he uh, dropped his stuff, dropped everything, yeah. and just came off with us as well. Because <laughs> honestly, I mean, this was at the end of a week of traveling there, and we had a couple of faint auroras during the week, and this was the second last night or the last night, something close last, yeah. close to the end of the, our journey, and and everyone had a aurora pictures but none of those were as spectacular as this one so this one really went boom boom and it went on for but sometimes you can have an aurora show and grow and then it reaches its peak and then five minutes later it's gone that's clearly possible in this case this thing just kept going for a couple of hours I was that's never... sometimes really the pain when you when you have northern light trips and after like four hours out in the cold it still goes on and it's it's not um getting less in activity and that that's the moment when you have to to finish yeah. the trip and you have to 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 pull the people back into the van and drive them back to the hotel yeah so this was one of those nights where it was just magnificent to see the intensity just being very very stable Yes, uh, and and I mean I've never been that cold because I mean you are on a <laughs> ship, so so you're only only a few meters away from a warm saloon, a warm cabin, um, but I just I couldn't go back in because every time I was like, okay, I'm freezing, I need to warm up a bit. A, a minute after I went inside, someone came back shouting from the decks like, oh, it's turning up again! <laughs> it's like everyone running around on the ship, and it was not often you have this aurora going on in one direction this was all around the ship in the front in the back to the sides uh, some were more intense so it's hard to de to decide where to go and i shot easily 300 photos that night and one thing you also have to to consider or take into consideration when you have those um environments uh, where it's really when you have those really cold clear nights and you have the possibility to drop in leave your camera outside because once you go inside it just fogs <laughs> up it fogs and, up yes <laughs> and you don't want to just clean your lens every single time you go outside um yep. or wait for it to to get clear again yeah um so here's another one taken off a ship and uh, that was my that was my very first time probably four or five years ago. That was my very first time when I shot the Aurora from a ship. And this was, okay, so <clears throat> this is the um, Rembrandt van Rijn. And it's a it's a bit, it, well, I wouldn't say it's bigger, but it was bigger than the one that the other one was shot off. So the ship was more stable, but still moving. And uh, this has an interesting story behind it because again, Aurora, Coming up, uh, I was I think I was in the cabin already, getting ready to sleep, and then I heard the the ruckus outside. And the the Rembrandt von Rhein has a has an PA system on board, so um, we agreed with our expedition leader that um, he could wake us up any time of the night when the aurora comes out, which was perfect because I was like almost getting ready for bed, and then oh the the PA comes in, it's like aurora on deck, aurora on deck. And everyone, like, you could, could hear the rustle. It was really exciting. Everyone jumped into their their clothing and uh, ran outside. And that was the first time I was confronted with, what do I do on a moving ship shooting the Aurora? So this was um, on one side, and it, 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 it was beautiful. And I decided to... Um, to do something that I've done several times since, and that is, well, set up a tripod, of course, because... Again, we're talking, this case, probably a two-second exposure. Um, so set up a tripod. And what you do then is you anchor your camera's motion to the ship's motion. So the camera and the ship move move the same way. So uh, I've deliberately included the ship as a foreground. The foreground is now sharp in focus. So even if the aurora is a slight little bit blurry from the motion it doesn't matter because you still have something in focus to to hang on to and the aura i mean the aura isn't usually very sharp edged anyway so a little bit of blur in there is not a big deal normally and you can see on the horizon that there is certainly some motion but it doesn't really matter so 
That was the one thing about this photo. The second thing about this photo is, you see the uh, group of people in the front? When you shoot Aurora in a group, you will inevitably have other photographers in the shot, unless you really stand side by side. But in this case, that was not possible because it was at the uh, at the, the front of the ship and it's triangular, so people have to crowd up there. And uh, there were tripods all over the place, up, up in front, like really legs going inside other legs. I mean, really like optimizing the space. And <clears throat> that group of people that you see on the photo also included a whole bunch of bright screens on the back of their of their cameras. Because <laughs> that's what happens, right? We have this LCD on the back and uh, you check the settings or you have the image review set uh, turned on. So uh, after you shot the shot, bang, the display comes on. So two things about that. First is, um, if you shoot at night, turn down the display brightness. If it's not automatic, um, turn it down as far as it goes. It will still be too bright, but um, you can avoid two things with that. First is um, you will not be as annoying in other people's pictures. And second is um, you will not blind yourself because if you have the display do bright and you will look at that, you will have this this rectangle uh, in front of your eyes for five minutes, you know, so you don't want that. So turn that down if at all possible. Um, and what I did here is I used the magic of editing and I cloned out the individual bright spots because they were too distracting. So all I did is I just went in and click, 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 cloned them out so they wouldn't distract. And I think that's perfectly fine. It's still a photo, but uh, I think it turned into a nicer photo this way. There's one more thing about this, which was, <clears throat> which was a lot of work. Um, that was a clear sky most of mostly, of, um, not, not many clouds in there, but that also means you see the stars. And if you see the stars, if you do a two second exposure of the stars, what you end up with is a lot of squiggly lines. Right, they're not points in the sky, but you're exposed for two seconds, so they will be little, whatever the wave motion of the ship does, you will have that uh, reflected in the little stars. So this picture was filled with 300 squiggly lines, probably. It's <laughs> really a pain to get rid of them. <laughs> and it was really, really distracting from the aurora. So I decided to take the time, and I think I spent a couple of hours on that, and went in and painstakingly painted out every single squiggly line. Just you, It's easy to do with today's software. You click on it or you paint on it, and then it fills it in with something that looks plausible there. So um, there's an entire like evening of editing in this photo. Um, but I still love it, and I love it for three, well, for several reasons. First of all, the, f the, the ship in the front. It was, it was a photo that changed my way of approaching aurora photography from a ship. Um, that's the first one. The second one, uh, I, I learned that, yes, you can edit that stuff if you want to. Um, <laughs> and third, what I like is the colors in the photo, because you have the, pr the three primary colors in there. So your camera works in red, green, and blue, RGB. That's the three color channels in your camera. And uh, I find pictures that include all of those quite satisfying. So you have the green of the aura, the blue of the sky, and then the red of the, well, bit of uh, dusk or dawn in the, in the, in the, uh, at the horizon. And there is a red tinge in the front as well. Now, I didn't see that initially. The red light that you see in the front is of one of the position lights of the ship which is shielded you know that the the, the light uh, the position light has a, a board in front of it to so you can only see it from the outside but it was reflecting back from a railing or something just a little bit and that was enough to give that whole front of the ship that red tint so um i call these rgb pictures red green and blue and they are um they feel more complete that way so also, the, the other thing that I didn't really get a good shot of, but um, in these times, the term is a bit is a bit of a different one. But you know what a corona is in terms of an aurora, right? Have you seen the corona? Um, which is when the aurora comes at you from the top, and it's like it's like you you look upwards, and it's almost like you're 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 shooting into a tunnel. 
which is uh, amazing. I mean, really fast, really choo -choo 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 -choo. and uh, lots of colors and things um, only happened for 20 seconds, maybe. But uh, someone, and this was like right after Depends. this photo. Can, someone, can last longer as well. Okay, so I, I haven't seen it longer. That was my only one and first one. And it was it was over after 20 seconds. So I looked up and I was like, holy cow, that is one of the wildest things I've ever seen. And then doof, it was over. And it's so. very difficult to take pictures of because um, coronas are actually, um, they can be all over the place as well. And then you really have to decide in what direction you want to uh, take yeah. pictures of. And it's, it's really difficult to actually frame a corona. It's really, really difficult. Uh, but but if you can, it it is. Um, I think it really helps. Again, if you're on a ship, to have the mast in there, to have some reference point in there in the front, um, certainly Indeed. makes sense. So, but to to add on the tips you you gave, um, we we have like when we do northern light trips, we always have the major issue that um, people are not used to move outside when it's dark, of course, mm -hmm. because. We got raised in, 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 in very illuminated um, environments nowadays. So that makes it very difficult. But um, when you go outside uh, on a Northern Lights trip, no matter if it's on a ship or um, just on land, please don't use flashlights. Don't use the flashlight <laughs> off your phone. You will be a super annoying for your fellow travelers. But B, you will also just um, lessen the chance for yourself to see northern lights because your eye has to adjust to the darkness again. And northern lights really work best with l uh, the least um, light pollution you can get. And yes. your little um, flashlight is enough for you to really destroy that kind of experience significantly. So and what the display on your camera, any light source is a problem. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So what I usually recommend is actually having um, red light covers. So what we use, for example, on trips is uh, like the, the, the mountain hat lights. Um, they have a red light mode. Mm -hmm. Use that. It's less annoying and your eyes can adjust much, much easier to the mm -hmm. darkness after the red light. And yeah. it's less annoying on pictures as well. There's even today's head, headlamps uh, sometimes have a red mode that you can turn yes. on. and then yeah, mo it, Most of them have that, yeah. And then uh, that's good for the night. And uh, if, if you've seen Das Boot or any other movies, and the, <laughs> with the, they, they do that um, when it's night and they, they, they set everything to red light and then the, um, their, their eyes have a, a better chance to adapt. Uh, so let's look at a few more um, while we're at it. Okay, so this is, <clears throat> this is one where, again, the Aurora wasn't that interesting or visible even to the naked eye even after adjusting for the darkness for like half an hour um but the camera brought it out and again i made the decision to make to spice it up a bit by shooting against um yeah a, 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 the shore on the other side of that of that um what is it a piece of i would say it's henningsvar it's probably it's, henningsvar um, in lofoten yeah yeah that's, that's and the you, bridge to Henningsvar. And the and the and the, the the location. If anyone wants to go there, um, what's the name of the fish burger place? Uh, Anita's Fish Burgers was it Anita. I think <clears> I, so. think, I think it's a very very. If you have been on Lofoten, there is no chance you missed that one. Um, so um, you can shoot across the bay, and I decided to have elements in there. You, you know that it really helps to bring out the interest in things if you include other elements. The same is true if you want to shoot a picture of the moon or, or fireworks or something. It always helps to include the surroundings to give it a bit more context um, than just itself. So pointing the camera straight upwards towards an aurora is nice, but if you can include other things, it helps from a composition point of view, some foreground. So the reflection helps it to become a bit more... Yeah, a reflection at symmetry. Symmetry adds stability to a photo. So more stability that way. Um, the other thing is the lights, of course. They give you a, a nice focal point there. So it's not necessarily just about the aurora. It's about the aurora over a, a town. That's what you get there. Uh, one thing I did is there's a road... Um, that goes on to the right, and uh, there was a car on that road, and of course the long exposure made that very pronounced. I edited that one out because it was in the way. So again, there's editing in 
uh, in certain shots, certainly in this one. Um, but you can see the stars are very uh, stable. So that was a short enough exposure. Another thing I loved about this, if you, if you look really close on the mountain range in the left, you will see that it has it's slightly illuminated from the warm orangey lights uh, of that of that uh, little town there and in the edit I, and i saw this glow but it wasn't quite as pronounced so in the edit later on i i just enhanced that a little bit i made that a little bit brighter to add a bit of context that there is a mountain and that it receives light from from the uh, town so worked really well for me um, also, the, conne the, the connection here, um, the combination of the aurora plus the clouds, I think, makes a nice, uh, interesting photo in the sky. Yeah, so you that's can see how the how both the, the the town and the aurora is illuminating the clouds from both sides. So yes, really you get you, you get this this whole light spectacular. Um, really happy with that. So this one again is one from the from the ship. Um, it, was, it was it's hard to it was hard to make a choice. It was really hard to make a distinct choice between the different photos. Um, normally what I do is if I have one good photo out of like an hour, that is the one photo I will show. I'll try to not show too many because that will dilute the individual pictures. I'd rather have one very strong picture that feels really good um, and show that as opposed to show, showing 20 different pictures. But for this Aurora uh, of the ship, it was just amazing. This is my first Aurora I shot which was in Iceland and uh, it was it was not too strong it was nice and what we did uh, luckily is we were in a, in a hotel and we were having dinner again at, during dinner time it's like okay Aurora is about to uh, become stronger let's go and we went out and uh, we were a group and we had a bus so the bus driver was still up and uh, then he took us to a place where we drove along the road and and on the way there in the afternoon, we already took a look at where would be a good spot to shoot the aurora from. And uh, we came to that bridge and the bridge has water under it and water makes reflections. And aurora in a reflection is always amazing looking. So there we chose to, uh, to place ourselves in front of that river and include that as a reflective surface. Um, that was also the first time I uh, I noticed how annoying other photographers in front of your camera can be with the displays on. And there was a lot of shouting in the night of going, go away, your light is on, turn your light off. So yeah, was... that's, that's when the guide usually comes in very handy, <laughs> uh, who, who knows the spots and who lines yes. up photographers so everybody yes. gets a nice uh, shot. Of course, um, the spot the other photographer has is always better than your own. So um, just... <laughs> Try to be a bit more, a bit more understanding and a bit patient. Um, I think every um, angle has its pros and cons. I usually um, prefer to go as low as possible, so you get a lot of the foreground uh, what you have in a landscape. But it really is also just personal taste. What I really like here is that you have um, like two types coming together. You have this diffuse area. You have a very, very light um, arc forming, like a band, which is going mm -hmm. out of the main area towards the left of the picture. And then you have a third one, those rays who are coming vertically down, where you actually can see how the particles enter the atmosphere and just react with the molecules in and the atmosphere that's really really amazing it's a great picture and then thank you and then you see the stars above um and then you see if you look very closely it's probably a satellite like probably, a, yeah. a streak across and uh, that looks like a sat satellite trail so uh some some people clone those out i left it in because it was kind of a I testament like it. it was a testament to the to the length of the exposure and uh i i love people to also kind of get an idea how the, how the sausage is made right it's not just the sausage it's the recipe as well um let's see do i have one more that's one more of the ship um, again couldn't help but putting more in there and that's the first one so here we go with aurora photography um uh, i hope that uh many of you will have that experience uh, one day how far south do auroras go usually <laughs> that's a very very tricky question um and i answer with my most favorite of all answers it depends it's 
it's depending on so many factors. One is the intensity of um, of the solar storm of the of the particles, the charge of the particles. Um, it depends what area are you at. Do you have a lot of light pollution? Are you on the countryside? Do you have very little light pollution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you have a, a couple of factors um, coming in. But I can tell you, I've seen uh, pictures as far south as Nuremberg in in uh, Germany mm -hmm. in uh, 1994 with amazing northern lights um very reddish northern lights it looks like this uh, the sky is on fire really great that happens not very often it's more likely on solar maximums so in another five to six years you might have a chance but if you look into folklore of uh, northern lights then you would figure that um, as far south as the mediterranean you have uh, northern lights um folklore you have they could uh, almost not be called mysteries. northern lights there right <laughs> They actually came up, so the, 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 the name Aurora Borealis um, refers to the Greek and Roman uh, mythology. So they came up with, the, uh, with those names. Uh, that gives you an idea how far south they were visible back in the days when um, artificial light wasn't, uh, wasn't the mm -hmm. matter, or not that much at least. And we have similar um, references in uh, Northern America, where um, the natives have just like reported or they just built up folklore around, uh, around Northern Lights as far south as Wisconsin, for example. So there are uh, possibilities. It's less likely nowadays just simply because of the light pollution. I mean, every road has um, road lights, has traffic lights. Every car is just disturbing. But if you have a chance and you're somewhere um, along the field, just give it a chance. If you have a huge um, activity in the sky as a forecast, just give it a chance. Go outside. Just look at the at the forecast when the the big band, which is uh, elliptical around uh, the area of the Arctic Circle, so it's not really staying on 66 degree north, but sometimes it's um, slipping down a little bit further um, on one side. Just get a nice forecast for where this position of the band um, is supposed to be at what time. And you might have a chance to see Northern Lights as far south as Germany or Central America. Very cool. So, thank you very much. That was it for today. Again, um, you can find us and a lot more stories from the Arctic and the Antarctic over at our website, CuriouslyPolar.com or wherever you find your podcast. We're on Twitter at CuriouslyPolar and on Insta at CuriouslyPolar. And uh, we'll be back in Let's see when we'll be back. I'm not going to make any <laughs> promises for now. Thanks, Henry. And thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. <laughs>